Hello there, good morning. So I'm recording this on a beautiful autumnal morning here in Manchester for you. I've got a uh, cup of coffee on the go and I'm about to introduce you to the wonderful world of mollusks. So this is a continuation of the, the course. So I hope you enjoyed the introductory lecture and the lecture on trilobites. And we're going to continue working our way through important invertebrate groups by looking at mollusks. So you, you can see some examples on this slide here. Now, actually, the mollusks are a really diverse and large group, and we're going to be focusing on three really important subgroups of the mollusks that are really very common as fossils. So it's really important that you're able to identify them and say something about them when you see them in a rock. As with the last lecture, this is um, split into three videos. This one is on the introduction and, oh, sorry, is an introduction to and features the biology of a mollusk. Number two, we'll be looking at the anatomy, the morphology of the major mollusk groups that we want to talk about. Bear in mind, mollusks do quite a lot um, with the morphology available to them. They're, they're, the, the groups we're talking about actually look really different to each other. So I hope that means it will be interesting for you. And then we'll finish by looking at, once more, what these things look like in a rock and also how they can help us about, geolo about geologists as geologists. Man, I think I need some more of this coffee. So let's start off with our introduction in our biology and let's talk about what makes a mollusk. So the mollusks, um, you can see some examples on this slide here. You can see in fact from this slide alone that they're really, really varied. They're a diverse group that includes um, animals that you no doubt know, such as slugs, snails, squid, cuttlefish, Octopodes, so that's octopuses, the plural for octopus. Octopi is in fact correct. It's like incorrect because it's a, a Greek word in origin. And the mollusks also include all manner of marine shellfish, such as clams, mussels, and oysters. Um, so looking at all of these creatures, you're probably wondering what they all have in common, and you would be right to do so. These animals range in size from less than a millimeter for the smallest one to the giant squid, which is probably, but not definitely, our largest mollusk. That's about 20 meters in length. So there's this huge variation in size. And this is a group of organisms, uh, a clade, that is incredibly successful. They're arguably the most common marine animals today. And obviously they have um, representatives on land as well in the form of snails and slugs. They're found in a wide range of habitats, so that includes the terrestrial that I just mentioned, all the way through shallow um, fresh water to marine environments, all the way down to the abyssal depth, so really deep in places. And they're found in everywhere from continental shelves and intertidal environments. So essentially, um, any ecosystem that you look at may well have a mollusk in it. Mollusks are usually unsegmented animals. So in contrast to the trilobites that we saw last week, these creatures don't have that clear segmentation of their body. They use a different way of building their body to, um, for example, arthropods. Many of them have shells, um, as you can see on the right here, but not all. And those are typically secreted as calcium carbonate, typically in the form of aragonite occasionally as calcite. In detail, there are quite a few fabrics within those shells across the group that we won't really be going into today. Uh, it's a group with, as I mentioned already, a lot of disparity. So I think because of that, sorry, disparity is kind of like the range of different morphologies or anatomies that the members of a group have. If they all look alike, they have a very low disparity. If they all look very different to each other, they have a very high disparity. Sorry, I should have defined that. Um, so yes, they are a group with a lot of disparity. And therefore, it makes sense, I think, in this lecture to dig a little deeper um, into what makes a mollusk. So what do these things all share? Well, we can. it's kind of difficult because they are very varied, but we can identify that they have a body plan that's essentially built on four features. The first is a head, which has sensory organs and associated with the head is also a thing called the radula. You can see an SEM image of one here. 
from a group called the gastropods. We'll be getting onto that in a minute. And a regula is a rasping, so kind of like a kind of grinding, uh, feeding organ. It's made of chitin. If you remember that from the first lecture, this is one of the hard parts that animals make their hard bits out of. It's actually a, uh, it's an organic um, polymer, which is quite interesting. And these, this regula is designed to scrape and in some cases drill. So it's used typically for feeding. So that package of things, the head and the regula, is one part of the mollusk body plan. The next part, so this is number two of our body plan, is the foot. So this was originally a sole-like structure and it's used by the animal for locomotion. You can think of the bits that snails used to move. And I've in fact put an, uh, uh, an example of one of these uh, gastropods, snails or gastropods here. And you can see that there's this foot at the bottom there, but it's present in all of the groups. It's considerably modified in many members of the group. So just bear that in mind. Part three of the body plan of mollusks is that these creatures typically have a mantle. So this is a sheet of tissue that lies dorsally, so on the kind of the back surface, as it were, over the organs. And this is responsible for secreting the shell. So you can see it labeled, for example, on a bivalve, which we, a group will be introduced to in a second here. And the mantle is the bit of the body around here that secretes the shell. Um, the mantle is inside the shell in a gastropod. And this is a a chitin. These are really cool creatures we won't be learning much about, but you can see that they also have this foot and then a dorsal mantle arrangement. Finally, they have their, these animals, so this is part number four of the mollusk body plan, they have their digestive, excretory, reproductive and circulatory organs enclosed in a cavity. So this is a thing that's actually called the cholemic cavity within the body. In many groups, that's relatively small. And there's another important cavity, the mantle cavity, which acts as a respiratory chamber for these animals. It's got gills in there and into which the excre excretory and reproductive ducts and indeed the anus open. And these products are generally then carried out on the exhalant current. So you've got these, these body cavities that are fairly diagnostic of the mantle so of the mantles of the mollusks as a whole. So though that's the four features of a mollusk body plan. But as I've already mentioned, there are lots of different ways that the mollusks have modified that body plan. So just bear that in mind. But it's really interesting to look at, I think. Um, so here you can see our evolutionary tree, the phylogeny on the right, and our taxonomy, the categorization on the left. And as you can see, the mollusks are a phylum. They are animals. They're split into nine different classes, some of which we'll be learning about today. Um, actually, as you can see from these question marks here, it's quite difficult to get an idea of diversity with this, within this group. I really struggled to get any kind of reliable figures for those, hence the question marks. Um, I was getting things with a 50% uh, error margin. Um, which is not particularly useful. So I think it's st strict to say that this group is not as widely studied as we may like, but there are about 85,000 species of mollusk. That's largely an uh, estimate based on the living members of the group. And as we'll learn over the course of this lecture, there were also lots and lots of extinct members of this group. So you can see on this diagram on the right in the phylogeny, these are protostome um, animals. So you remember that big division between two major groupings within the um, bilaterian animals, all based on the embryology. We covered that in the first lecture. These are a member of a clade called the Lophotrochozoa. It's not a particularly uh, beautiful name that rolls off the tongue very easily, but it refers to the fact that many of these organisms have a thing called a lophophore, a feeding organ. Um, again, some have lost it, so not universally true, but there you go. Um, the exact relationships within the Lophotrochozoa are debated, and there is current research as to the sister group of the mollusks. So I have therefore um, not committed to any particular relationship in this uh, tree. The mollusks are closely related to wormy creatures, um, annelids, uh, so if, uh, earthworms are an excellent example of the annelids, 
and the bryozoa and the brachiopoda. Um, the brachiopods we'll be learning about in another lecture. But yeah, um, exact evolution, evolutionary relationships um, within that clade are unknown, but we are sure that mollusks are lophodrocosomes of some form, give or take. So that is where these animals sit on the tree of life. And I wanted to also, because I think it's really interesting, highlight some of the um, fantastic work that's happened recently looking at the early origins of this group. So in terms of major um, phyla, animal phyla that are still around today, I guess it's fair to say these are a tiny bit unusual in that there are late Precambrian examples that most researchers agree may represent our first mollusks. So it may be that um, most of the mollusks that we see today were descended from forms that were actually around before the Cambrian explosion, such as Kimberella, shown down here on the bottom of this phylogeny that I've stolen by a paper by Jakob Winter and colleagues, which looks at the early origins of this group. So that's a tiny bit unusual. And indeed, if you've heard of the small shelly fossils, that kind of euphemi euphemistically named group that, um, uh, that Rob may have taught you about in the first year where we don't really know what they are, they're just small bits of uh, carbonaceous kind of material, it may well be that some of those are um, bits of mollusks as well. The early Cambrian, you may recall from your first year lectures, was a time of experimentation amongst all um, animal groups and the, and the uh, mollusks are no exception. There were numerous short-lived and fairly weird molluscan groups um, early in the Cambrian which dominated the fossil fauna. So it looks like there were lots of interesting um, experiments on the, the mollusk body plan as it were. And this includes iconic, ta um, iconic species such as Wawaxia, which you can sh see here. This is a very famous fossil that we know from the Burgess Shale in um, Canada. And for other and other um, really quite iconic creatures, if you're a paleontologist, you come across these as uh, on a regular basis, such as the Halcariids, as a, a, an example of these here. So some of these weird wonders of the Cambrian explosion are now recognised as belonging somewhere on this the mollusk tree, as you can see here. Many of them are within extinct lineages of that mollusk tree, but nevertheless, they're probably mollusks. So these um, bizarre but distinctive early mollusks um, and this collection of mollusks that was around at the time form the basis for a subsequent radiation of the mo mollusks, um, particularly during the late Cambrian and the early Ordovician. This is when many mollusk groups that we recognize and are more certain about what they are start appearing. In terms of their geological history, I've also just made a quick note here that during the Mesozoic, many mollusks developed protective strategies against predation, such as robust armour or deep infernal um, modes of life, so burying themselves deeply in the sediment. They may also have relied on a shape, kind of a, a, a wide variety of different shapes and colours to confuse predators. So even though um, many of the major groups are established quite early on in the geological column, at least in the Phanerozoic part of the geological column. Um, there are still some um, interesting innovations, some evolutionary occurrences that happen in, through the evolution of this massive group. So that brings us on to the, uh, the meat of this lecture, and that is the mollusks that are common in the fossil record. You can see represent representatives of the three groups that we're going to be talking about today on this image here. So from the simple beginnings as a Precambrian limpet-like creature that crawl crawled, we've got this spectacular range of shapes and sizes of mollusks. Um, they're really important as fossils because they're hard calcareous shells fossilized quite easily. They've got a very good preservation potential, if you remember that phrase from our um, first lecture, and this means that they're common in the fossil record, with estimates in the tens of thousands of species range. So we've got thousands of mo fossil mollusk species. The three significant groups that I wanted to cover today that are important as fossils, um, I will introduce in just a second. But bear in mind that there are some other extinct groups that we'll not be covering, but you may be coming across 
in some field areas. So we're kind of, um, we're limiting what we're covering to the important stuff because we've only got a little bit over an hour to talk about these things. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them in Zoom. So without further ado, the three groups that we're going to be looking at are the cephalopods. These are shown on the left. These are arguably um, some of the most more complex mollusks. They have a well-developed head. They have sensors and a nervous system. They include nautiloids, which are still around today, um, shelled mollusks that are found in the, the sea. I'll show you some pictures of those later. The ammonoids that you can see here, which are really, really important as fossils, and the coleoids. So these are um, squid, octopodes, and cuttlefish. This group is carnivorous. The next group that we'll be looking at is the gastropods. The, this is a group of mollusks that undergo torsion uh, in early life. This is their body twists around and they have a single shell which is often coiled as you can see from this image here. The group has adapted to a wide range of environments from the marine to the, uh, to the terrestrial, so based on land. So snails are a really good example of a terrestrial gastropod. The bivalves, which you can see on the right here, are our final group. And these are named after their two shells within which the animal lives. Those shells are characterized by a huge variety of shapes, uh, dentition, so that's the name for the teeth that join them together, and muscle scars. We'll learn what those are in the next um, video. And they're adapted for a wide range of life strategies in marine and some freshwater environments. So if you think of mussels as in the food that we eat, these are an example of a bivalve. As we've already discussed, this group has their origins fairly deep. So the Precambrian to Cambrian, um, mollusks are definitely around. The groups that I've put on this graph for you here have been chosen to demonstrate um, when particular members of the mollusks um, were around, so particularly the colored ones that you can see here, so you can kind of get a grip for when they may be useful. In particular, a thing to note is that ammonites, sorry, ammonoids, um, we'll get onto what that, the difference between those two is in just a bit, probably video two, ammonoids, shown in red here, were really, really diverse during the Mesozoic. So bear in mind that these are, this is normalized, so you take the maximum number of genera per stage and divide it by, um, each each data point by that number to normalize this graph. So all this shows is um, relative um, abundance of this group as fossils. But you can see that these ammonoids are really abundant in Mesozoic rocks. Bivalves, um, you can see here in this blue line, uh, became increasingly common as filter feeders, um, particularly after the Paleozoic, and were subject to an evolutionary arms race um, in the Mesozoic called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. So they've got increasingly common as time has gone past, we think. But bear in mind, this is just based on what we find in rocks and isn't corrected for biases. Both they and the gastropods, which you can see here in light blue, appear have to have peaked in diversity towards the end of the Mesozoic through to today. So they're more diverse today than we think they were in the past. The ammonites, ammonoids, sorry, you can see went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Recent work using both the DNA of lemon groups and the morphology, the anatomy of these organisms, splits the mollusks into two major groups or clades. So these are the relationships within the mollusks, just so you can get an idea of how these groups may be related to each other. One of those clades, the aculifera, is made of a group called the apicophorans. These are essentially just mollusks that lack shells. They're small, deep water, exclusively benthic marine mollusks. And another group called the polyplicophorans, sometimes called the chitons or the sea cradles, um, which have two or more plates. So this is another marine group, but one that's found in many environments. So that's, the, uh, that's one clade, and none of the creatures that we're talking about today are found in that clade. The other clade, um, the conchifera, or the shell mollusks, include the groups that we'll be looking at in more detail today. So you can see that the gastropods are here. You can see that also that we don't really know the relationships within 
this grouping here. So we're not sure how the bivalves are related to the gastropods and these other clades around here, including the cephalopods. So whilst we, we're confident these are a grouping, we're not confident of the relationships within that group, if that makes sense. Bear in mind also that this is just one possible phylogeny, and it's one that has stronger support from, paleo from paleontologists than those that are working on modern mollusks. Why you should, should you care about the mollusks? Again, I think this is worth um, asking. Uh, firstly, because they have this rich fossil record, and that means they're really useful to us as geologists. Um, the last section of this talk is going to, so this talk, the last video associated with this lecture is going to be providing more information uh, about how that is. They've also been really useful as a result of this rich fossil record for studying evolution in deep time. Um, so they're good for paleontologists and good for life sciences as well. And they're re because they're a really diverse group, um, they are important for many ecosystems today. For example, they are the largest marine phylum, as I've already mentioned. And as you can see on this graph, they have um, somewhere um, estimated at around 200,000 living species. This makes them really, really quite diverse, especially compared to organisms such as mammals, for example. We're talking about a major component of the, um, the life on Earth today. And they're Im important for many, for us as humans, for many reasons. They're an important food source and have been uh, historically for a very long time. They're a source of luxury goods, including pearls and mother of pearl. And um, a number of uh, fairly ancient dyes have been based on um, these organisms. They're pests on crops, and they're also a vector for important diseases that occur in parts of the world, um, such as schistosomiasis. So they have significant impact on humans as well. For all those reasons, I think the mollusks are an important group and it's worth our time learning about them. So that was a, um, a very much a crash course in the mollusks. And we're going to be spending a bit more time looking at those three major fossil groups in the next video, learning about their anatomy. So I'll see you then in a minute.